Welcome to the Callaway Golf Podcast. We are live once again. I'm kind of getting the uh, enjoyment of doing all these live ones with you guys. I love getting the questions that you guys are sending our ways. We are going to be on Facebook. We're going to be on YouTube. We're going to be on uh, Twitter, Periscope. So hit our questions up and joining us from uh, South Florida, something I'm very excited about, a geographic location there is Olin Brown. What's going on, Olin? How are you? It's great to, great to be with you today. Yeah, so look, um, I could do seven hours here on the NFL draft, but uh, there's other networks that are going to do that. I'm just going to wear my doll. No, 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 no. And, uh, I, I, I think we should. I think we should hit on the NFL draft. All right. Well, take the, sure. give, give me give, give me your thoughts. I'm uh, I, I get more pessimistic by the moment, but that's because I'm a Dolphins fan. Well, I mean, they're obviously. I, I live in Tequesta in South Florida, and, and there's a lot of speculation about what the Dolphins are going to do, and you know the whole tanking for Tua thing, and now they're talking about Justin Herbert from. Uh, Oregon maybe being that pick and then the surprise idea that they might trade up to the third pick to get an offensive tackle I guess this guy Justin Wirfs is a big is a is a kind of a high-flying prospect at the moment so yeah. there's going to be a lot of intrigue tonight and uh, there's no doubt that the Dolphins have they've done a good thing you know they brought in a solid coach Brian Flores is solid and uh, everybody was assuming they were tanking last year and they won five of the last seven or eight games and really put a rush on the end of the year and gain a lot of respect around the league. And I think, I think they're going to surprise some people. And especially with, with uh, Brady having left the, the division and heading down to Tampa Bay, kind of Southwest Florida or West central Florida, mm-hmm. the AFC East is wide open. I know I am uh, hopefully <clears throat> optimistic. Look, if, if we can get to a, and we get to a, I will be thrilled. Uh, I went to the Rose bowl this year and watched Herbert and he had a great game there, but Something scares me about him. Uh, I think it's that that accuracy thing, um, and the idea of trading up and getting a tackle. I, it, it, I'll probably hit my head on the desk, but that's okay. I'll, I'll get through. It's it. not a not a sexy pick, but you know what? No. Joe Thomas in Cleveland for ten years. You know, guys yeah. like that. The Matthews in who was in uh, in uh, Houston forever, and he's in the Hall yeah. of Fame. I mean, yeah. th- these guys are solid pieces. But you know, the other side of it is, is that is that I, I'm not sure that Herbert had the opportunity to really show his skills when he was out in Oregon. They, they asked him to push the ball down the field a lot, and yeah. I mean a lot. So he never hit his checkdowns. He never played the, the short ball game. And I, I don't know whether that means he's that's not a skill set or whether that it yeah. was part of the offensive requirement out there that they were going to, you know, they're going to stretch the field. It's a little bit like watching the LA Lakers back in the seventies and late seventies and early eighties when magic and Kareem and James yeah. Worthing, those guys were pushing the ball up the floor. I don't know. You know, I mean, it, there, there are so many things that, you know what, we're fans, right? We love, mm-hmm. we love the game. We love what it brings. We love the excitement of it. But man, there's so many subtleties that it, it's, you know, I was hoping, for example, that the Dolphins years ago, we're going to, we're going to uh, take Patrick Willis with the first pick yeah, and, and get, um, and get um, Russell Wilson later yeah. in the draft. Cause you know what Russell Wilson did when he was in college was pretty impressive. I mean, the guy, mm-hmm. the guy got, he signed a baseball contract coach at North yeah. Carolina state didn't like that. So he, yeah. he said, you know what, I'm going to graduate. I'm going to Wisconsin. Go to Wisconsin. And in s- six weeks, he learned the offense, became a captain, yeah. won 11 games. And now he's one in the conversation for the best quarterback in the league. So there's all kinds yeah. of things that can happen. I know. All right. Well, we can talk football all day, but let's get into a little bit of golf. We want to hear your Let's. questions with uh, Olin Brown. Uh, so many questions. The only thing that I can say is no matter what, we will do better than the Bengals will tonight. They'll have a great first pick, but they'll screw up the rest of the draft. <laughs> all right, let's move on. Um, you know, you have so many unique distinctions in, in your career. I don't want to talk about it like uh, I'm not trying to be disrespectful in terms of how long you've played, because obviously you, you've you played for so many years. But I mean, to me, the one that I love the most is is winning on the Nationwide Tour, the the Champions Tour and, and the PGA Tour. But also you've been with Callaway for for I don't want to say forever because that's not true, but you've been with Callaway for a long time. So I want to kind of dive into that relationship with Callaway. What makes it work for you and, and what's kept you with the company for so long? Because so many people kind of change equipment through through their career. You've been so consistent with the Callaway brand. Well, the easy answer is Callaway, I, I feel, has always made great product. You know, back in the day when I signed with Callaway, 1992, January, I was the first guy that Ely signed for the PGA Tour. And I actually heard the door slam behind me after being introduced to Ely Callaway, Dick Helmstetter, and Don Dye. And uh, I was sitting there across the table from those three guys, and that's how my first contract came about. So I feel special kinship. You know, over the years, I've met so many great people at Callaway, uh, and some of them are still there, which is great. So I have a lot of familiarity. 
uh, I pick up the phone occasionally and just call people to say hi. And that's one of the things that I really value. And part of my relationship with everybody at Callaway is the continuity. It's been, you know, it's 30 years now. So I feel great or almost 30 years. I feel great almost about 30. that relationship. And I feel about uh, great about the equipment. You know, Callaway has always produced, you know, back in the day in the early 90s, they were really innovative. I mean, when Warbird technology came out and that driver looked different than anything else and performed differently. Um, there was real value in that. And then, of course, over the years, Callaway's always put R&D at the head of everything. And, uh, you know, while there are cycles in product and some looks better and performs better and acts better and you, you, the ability that we have to tweak and customize and do all that kind of stuff nowadays is really second to none. Can, can you give me a little bit of a history lesson about because um, you remember when when Ely was was still running the company, he was still alive. Um, right. You know, he he wanted to. He was a he was a maverick innovator. He was a maverick salesperson and and spokesperson. Tell me a, a, a memory you have of him, whether it's the million dollars he offered to whoever won with with Big Bertha or. Uh, just some moment with him, because I think, uh, you know, unfortunately, we're, we're, we're having less and less people who had contact with him that are still, you know, in the game today. So just to remind people just sort of how special he was. Ely was one of those very few people who could communicate and be comfortable and make comfortable any person that he was around. Um, you know, the, the simple and the glib answer is to say something like Ely could sell ice boxes to Eskimos. Do you know what I mean? I mean, he was that kind of he had an ability to to communicate and to make a connection with people that I have seldom seen in, in, uh, in my travels, you know, and certainly I'm not, but I've been a lot of places playing golf and met a lot of people. And that's one of his ingratiating qualities. I felt, you know, he, he, uh, he was, he was a gent and he loved what he did and he loved the people who, who helped him do it. And you know what? He, made it possible for everybody to feel important and feel like they were participating in the process. And it's a gift. There's no question about it. You know, there's some people who are dictatorial and there's some people who, who defer to other people and let them do the work. Ely was all things to all people. And he had a unique ability to adapt and to be inclusive. And he was very strong willed. Um, doesn't mean he was wishy-washy, but he, he certainly, he certainly was, uh, he was a unique character. So let, let's get into a little bit of the equipment. Um, if, if you had to pick your top three drivers all time in, in 28 years at Callaway, can you rank them? Or is it, or is it like children where you can't pick, and you know, which Do they have to be in any order? Well, I mean, you know, no. it's, it, it's a lot like kids in that they show up one way and they develop and they grow. And, <laughs> and so I, I would say, uh, in all seriousness, and you can check my stats, I mean, I'm already driving it 10 or 12 yards farther with my new, with my new Maverick this year. It's a 10.5. Um, Sub-Zero head, and it is better than any driver I've ever had. But I think certainly you have to go back to the Warbird as, a, you know, the, the, the first driver that really looked different than any others. And then probably the next generation was probably the uh, Big Bertha, mm -hmm. right? Or yeah. maybe the Great Big, maybe the Great Big. Yeah, I remember that one. I mean, that, that was just something that, you know, and it's funny because if you look at one of them now, we have a few laying around the office. They're, they're really small. But if you look at, you know, kind of at, at, at the time, it was, it was so revolutionary compared to what else was out there. It was just incredible, you know, and the yeah. idea of redistributing weight and being able to lengthen golf clubs so that, so that they were efficient. They weren't just a load that you had to slug around, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. there, there was real thought that went into things. And, um, yeah. and the R&D, &D, you know, the mad scientist, Dick Helmstetter and his crew and the whole thing. Mm -hmm. and, then the, and then the test center. And uh, it's just, you know, in a lot of ways, Callaway set the bar and, set, and, and started the golf, the golf club technology revolution. Yeah. All right. Well, we got some questions, Olin, so let's get to them. Eric wants to know, how does the competition on the Champions Tour compare to competition on the PGA Tour? It's a great question. Um, fields are a little bit different. They're smaller, about half the field size. But I'll tell you what, what happens. On the PGA Tour, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of fluctuation. Champions Tour, there isn't. So there are 50, 50 new guys that come on tour every year, which means that 50 guys fall off. And, you know, the, the window of stardom is between 10 and 20 years. You look at a guy like Phil or Tiger, people like that, you know, those are the guys that are at one extreme end. And then the new guys is fresh blood every year, but it's, it's a significant portion of the fields on the PGA tour champions. You got guys out there who are fairly consistent and they stay out there fairly consistently, but the window is much shorter. So it's a, it's basically a 10 year window and people know it when they get out there, 
Uh, I remember one player in particular came up to me and said, you're going to love it out here. Everybody takes it easy. Nobody hits balls. We're all in the bar afterwards. Having, and, you know, I'm looking down the range at Tom Kite, and he's got a pile of balls there just as high as it's ever been, working his tail off to make sure that he could perform the next day. And, uh, you know, I just didn't see it that way. And and the truth is that that uh, the competition is ferocious. You've got Hall of Famers. It's the only It's the only tour in all of sport where you can see current hall of famers perform at such a high level. So it's really competitive. Yeah. And, and to see, you know, some, some people, you know, we, we did some work together with Fox, uh, you know, in the TV world, but to see like a, a Steve flesh out there to see a McCarran out there to see Brett Quigley, who, you know, lives not, not far from you, who goes out there, what is second or third tournament wins. Um, yeah. You know, I, I love seeing stories like that because, you know, one of my favorite things growing up and a lot of the younger audience, well, there used to be this thing called magazines and there's this one called Sports Illustrated it used to be kind of cool. <laughs> and they used to do this ish issue every summer when they wanted their two week vacation. But where are they now? And golf's ultimate where are they now is is, is the PGA Tour champions. And exactly. I, I've always loved the idea of of seeing, you know, like to me, seeing longer out there now, you know, grinding over putts, it's it's the 91 Ryder Cup all over again, and, and no other sport kind of does that. All right, next question uh, from Matt. What are some of your other hobbies outside of golf? When you're not playing golf, where, where are we finding you all? I, I love I love fishing. I love being outside, you know. I, I, love, uh, I love outdoor sports. So uh, I'm a water rat. I like being in the water, snorkeling, scuba diving. Um, haven't done a lot of diving lately, but uh, I'm a big fisherman. We live right near the ocean. I live on the Laxahatchee River. So many chances that I get a hop in the boat, I head out offshore catching, you know, sailfish or wahoo, dolphin. I like to bottom fish a lot. Mutton snapper is, I think, the household favorite here. That's social distance. You can be social, it's social distance. distance. The it's social distance. To to totally appropriate. Yep. Yeah. Totally appropriate. I love that. All right. Uh, next one from <laughs> Phil. I don't think this is Mickelson, but Phil, uh, where do you stand on the distance debate? Uh, well, it's a big, it's a big conversation. I don't think there's any question if you look at it statistically that there's been a flip from controlling your ball off the tee, getting it in play to how far you can hit it. And that, that started happening in the nineties. And it really took place starting at the end of 99 with the evolution of, uh, of wound ball technology into solid core technology. And, um, if you look at, at, uh, at the statistics, you know, guys are driving the ball 30 and 40 yards farther than they did 40 years ago, which, you know, the argument is, is that the athlete or is it the equipment? And I would argue that there was never a better athlete than Sam Snead. And I don't care who you're talking about. And there was never a stronger player than Jack Nicklaus. And I don't care who you're talking mm -hmm. about. And so the truth is, is that uh, technology has had a huge impact in that. And it's not just club head, it's golf ball. And it's the relationship yeah. between how the golf ball comes off the club head. And the fact that the composite heads, allow bigger club heads to be, to be made. And, and, uh, you can put longer shafts. So now, you know, average drivers 45 and a half inches compared to the old days where it was 43 to 40 and, uh, 43 and a half and the increased yeah. arc increases club head speed. And there's no doubt about it. Well, the other thing, but, too, the, ball, but the ball enables, the ball enables people to hit it, to swing as hard as possible and keep the ball from going in the bushes mm -hmm. a lot more than yeah. it used to. And remember, you know, we're all dating ourselves here, but when you used to want to go for a fitting, <laughs> right. And they would build you a driver. And there was no adjustability, no, you know, they're not going to pop the top off, put a wrench and switch to another head. So testing was really hard. So they brought you like, here are the four we got. And you kind of, you know, got one of them that worked, you know, 20 years ago. Where now the, the amount of between track man, uh, I think one thing that gets overlooked is just the agronomy of the golf courses, right? Just how, how, sure. how the ball can hit those fairways, you know, and, and those are like greens, you know, compared to what, what they used to be 25, 30 years ago. Yeah, but but the reality of it is that the golf ball allows people to carry it well over 300 yards, which nobody did yeah. back in the day. But but it's not it not it not just all that. It's it's also the idea that that you know you found a driver that worked 40 years ago, mm -hmm. and if it went bad on you, you couldn't find another one. So yeah. equipment is more replaceable now than it used to be, and this is something that nobody talks about either. I mean, I love my driver right now. If something God forbid were to happen to it, I could get one that's pretty close. But there were oftentimes when guys couldn't replace the driver, and that was a real factor. Well, Bjorn is building you a backup as we speak. All right. Uh, he's a good man. He is a very good man, but he's building you your backup. That's that's what we need him <laughs> to be doing right now. All right, this question from uh, Richard Cox. He wants to know about your affinity for the Callaway golf ball. Uh, and as they improved and changed, did you switch golf balls often? Uh, I believe you're in the Chrome Soft decks right now. Um, right. What was sort of the journey to get there um, from Chrome Soft to Chrome Soft X for, to before that speed regime or whatever, you know, you were playing? 
Well, the, the first ball that I ever saw was the rule 35. And yeah. I remember, I remember, yeah, I remember, I remember back in, it was right at the turn of the century, 2000, right? And yes. um, there was no question. And there was a blue ball and a red ball. Mm -hmm. And I liked the feel of the blue, even though it went shorter than the red, because it was more familiar. And as I came to understanding the technology and the advantages of being able to hit the ball differently with the new product, I, I gravitated towards the red. But the really significant jump, I think the first one was the HX Tour, because mm -hmm. the launch changed. The ball, the ball started going up and over. And I remember the first time in competition where I hit the ball and it went a lot farther than I, I was expecting it to. It, it cost me on that particular hole, but it had it had legs in the long run. You know what I mean? So, I mean, yeah. I, I hit a ball with a five iron that went literally 12 yards farther than I had ever imagined it could, that I could hit it. And so mm -hmm. that was the first kind of moment where I really recognized that something could be that quantifiably different. Yeah. And uh, if you want to learn more about the history of the Callaway Golf Ball, go to CallawayGolf.com. We have a documentary we uh, did it earlier this year, the ball that changed the town. It's about 25 minutes long. There's plenty of time these days to watch stuff like that, but it goes, uh, really tells the story of the Chicopee golf ball plant where all the tour balls are made uh, right here in the USA. Which is, which, which, is a, which is a really cool, really cool place. I've been a couple of times, met some yeah. of the guys doing the work there. And it's just incredible. Nobody really understands what goes into the making of a golf ball. And it's really, no. it's really involved in, in, in the, the constant changing of it. The evolution of this product is incredible. And the new, like you said, the Chrome Soft X, it's just incredible because it combines combines the, the ability to launch the ball the way you want to with playability around the greens and that you know that's what we're looking for we're looking for the ball that does all of it yeah and my source who's busy building this club for you said that one of the reasons that csx was a great fit for you is controlling your irons better is that something you were looking for just more consistency knowing that that the distance is going to go exactly where you needed to yeah so here's a here's an interesting conversation i rarely hear people talk about it but ball, golf ball technology used to be about low launch and high spin so we all built our games around that. Well, when the, when the lower spin balls that launched up in the air came about, guys who could really hit the ball hard, they're able to get the ball way up in the air and they stop their ball with trajectory, not with spin. So I was having trouble because my ball wasn't coming in at the, pro the proper angle. So my ball would hit where I wanted it to, but then it released farther. And so I was forced to, to kind of compromise a little bit and use a ball that had the, the launch and spin characteristics. So I might've lost a couple of yards off the tee with the driver, but I gained so much more with my iron play and around the greens, it made all the difference. Yeah, well, that's a great, great uh, piece of advice that you guys at home watching can, can take to your own game. You know, get a sleeve of each and go around and practice and see where your pitch marks are, where the ball is hitting, how much it's releasing, and notice maybe that 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 trade off is going to be worth it. All right, next question. Well, not only here. Jeff, not only Jeff, just to add to that to that yeah. point, you, you it can be conditions dependent too. You know, you get into oh, a totally. situation where it's been raining like crazy for a long time, and you want to max your carry and kind of reduce your spin rates a little bit, and that can have an impact on your scoring too. So, I mean, there's so many different components that go into playability that uh, if you can if you can dial it in and understand your product, I mean, you're ahead of the next guy. Yeah, for sure. All right. Next one from Tim. Favorite stops on each tour, uh, PGA Tour and PGA Tour champions. I, I, you know what? I always loved playing the old Castle Pines, the international tournament, playing yeah. the elevation there oh, the in milkshakes. Colorado. It was so much funny. The milkshakes were off the charts, but it wasn't just the milkshakes. The food, it yeah. was the finest dining of yeah. the year. It was the best, best restaurant on tour. Yeah. Not, I'm not talking about Clubhouse. I'm talking about for the year. So that yeah. place was great. I loved there. Pebble Beach, I always loved because I played with the same guys every year. And uh, mm -hmm. Pebble Beach is just Pebble Beach. And so, you know, the idea that we can still play there in the first tee with the kids mm -hmm. takes it up another, ratchets it up another notch. You know, you're playing with these incredible kids. I mean, I, I played with kids, so I promise you're going to be running for Senate and President or they're going to be running corporations down the road. Mm -hmm. They're great kids. They're model citizens. They, they get it. And, uh, the, and, and it's the, part of the fun of it is to see their eyes bugging out of their heads to be able to play a place like Pebble Beach for a week. It's just, it's so much fun, I can't tell you. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting you said that because uh, kind of my whole theory about what kind of what this quarantine has done to us as golfers is, you know, for, for those of us who don't play for a living, uh, sometimes we have the tendency to take golf for granted that, you know, you get a phone call from your buddy like, hey, let's go play. And you're like, well, I got this other thing to do. I'll just play golf with you next time. And, and having these five, six weeks, obviously way bigger issues going on, but having golf sort of taken away from you, um, that, that's on my bucket list is uh, a call to Steve John and try to get up to 
to, to I, I've, I've spent, I, I have a great collection. You guys play the top hundred golf courses. I go work at a lot of the top hundred golf courses. It's kind of my own little chart that I have, but I'm going to try to flip that a little bit, but Pebble, you can't beat it. And uh, the, the, the international, the international was one of my favorite tournaments uh, back when I was at USA network. We used to cover it every single day. We would get the, uh, the two 30 or three o'clock rainstorm, which meant we had to send Charlie Reimer into the locker room to interview you guys. And he never did interviews because Charlie would just guzzle these milkshakes the whole time until we got off the air. He was working on his physique in those days. Yeah, yeah, for sure. He's, he's, <laughs> he's just still a work in progress. All right, we got more questions here for you. Uh, Wayne wants to know, what is the single best exercise for senior golfers to get or to maintain flexibility? Oh, uh, no, there's a great, uh, you know, I don't think there is a single best. Certainly stretching, if you do Pilates, yoga. I, I asked the guys in the fitness trailer if I should start doing yoga, and they said, no, you're going to hurt yourself. So I, I don't do it, but I know that a lot of people do. And, and if I were to commit to it and start, but flexibility is the, is the biggest, I think, key to maintaining your rhythm and your swing as you age. So it, it's something that I noticed that I, I've struggled with as I've gotten older, but it, I would say flexibility as a general concept. All right, we're here with Holden Brown on the Callaway Golf Podcast, spending some time with him, asking him your questions. So if you're watching live, uh, please ask us some questions. If you're listening after the fact, enjoy uh, the knowledge that he's dropping on. Also, if you haven't listened to The Fitting Room with uh, Dylan Fratelli, uh, who Dylan is using the triple track on the golf ball and in the putter. Uh, and the guys went kind of deep with him on that, but he, he's an equipment junkie as well. That came out Monday. And then uh, yesterday, on Wednesday, we had uh, Georgia Hall and Charlotta, Carlota Saganda join Lex and Sarah in the Girls and Golf podcast. So uh, check those two podcasts out when you're done with this one. Uh, next question is Jim. Jim would like to know if you've been getting out and playing at all during this uh, quarantine. And if there, if there is, are you doing what some of the other uh, players we've had in here talked about? They're working on specific things because it's really the one time you get a break. I actually have not. And, and the reason for that is there's nothing to get ready for. And I don't want to waste my energy doing that so i've been mm -hmm. kind of lying low and you know living in south florida we haven't been on mandatory anything but we have been on social distancing and we have been asked to do our part so we're doing that in our household and we get out we get out and walk a lot and uh you know we got a dog that we take out every day he's loving the, the social distancing yeah. and the quarantine because he's getting a lot of extra a lot of extra work but but no i i haven't and you know what that, that's not good for my golf swing but it's really good for my brain so you know, I'll, I'll be fresh and ready to go when we get up and going again. So when you get going again, and, and how many holes, uh, Grace, will you give yourself before you get mad at the first shot you hit that doesn't go exactly how you have it planned? Won't last long. Won't last long. <laughs> <laughs> Two, three holes max. <laughs> All right. Next one is from uh, Stephen Rogers the second. Uh, wants to know, how could I fix my drives from going to the right? I mean, just aim well, further left, but. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why, and without having uh, a, a video of the swing, I, yeah. I could just say in general that if, you're, if your tee shots are going right, there are a couple of things that could be happening. One is if it starts right, your face is obviously delivering open to the, to the strike. And if they're moving right, then your path is left of your ball Come across and, and, you're, and you're applying side spin. So there are a couple of, if, if it's a side spin issue, then what you're doing is you're getting too steep. You're throwing the club with your right side away from you, and then you're dragging it across with your left arm. Um, maybe a, an idea for that would be to set up with a very, very close thing. So I'm not talking about a couple inches. I'm talking about two and a half feet. And it'll, it'll help you keep your upper body back a little bit longer and get your hands and club head more involved in the shot. And, that might, and, and it might help your path go a little bit more uh, inside out. And the other thing is if your club face is open, there are a couple of problems. One is the shaft may, may not be staying with you. You might have too soft a shaft. And the other thing is you might have uh, a grip issue. So you might check your grip. Make sure when you, you, you want at least a neutral grip when you play, which is a couple of knuckles. Everybody knows what that means. Just you take your grip with your left hand. You look down on the club. You want to see at least two knuckles in the back of your left hand. Uh, but, you know, go to your local club pro and have him check the shaft because if you're playing with a, a shaft that's way too soft, you're swinging at 110 miles an hour, you're swinging a, a regular shaft, you're going to have a problem squaring the club. All right. And another thing you could do, uh, Stephen, is you can go to the Callaway community, community.callawaygolf.com. We have a, a coaching corner set up. And uh, I guess about once a week, Matt will let me know here in a second if I say this wrong. We have different uh, master staffers from Callaway who are going in there and helping people with their swing. And I believe you can upload video and stuff. We had Devin Bonebreak in there yesterday, our good buddy here from Rolling Hills, just up the road in uh, uh, Palos Verdes, Florida. But go post your swing in the Callaway community. We'll get one of our staffers to look at it and they can offer you uh, some more specific advice to you. All right. Next one, Rob, 
This is going to be a good question. What's your go-to meal at home been during this quarantine? <laughs> we had uh, black and tuna the other night, which was pretty sporty. Oh, nice. Um, go-to meal. Wow. We've been eating a lot of chicken, a lot of hamburgers. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the tuna, we caught some blacks in the other day, and, th and that really hit the spot. Okay, I'll be going in the Cowboy community and sending you my address because uh, we would we would love to try some of that. I'll ship we've you been, It's funny we we've been we've been eating so well during this quarantine. Uh, you know we too uh, well, right? Yeah, I mean it's been, but it's actually been super fun in terms of like planning meals. We started doing one of those uh, community boxes of uh, produce. So we have a produce box that comes every Wednesday, and you don't want to waste anything. So I'm learning new ways to cook cabbage and cauliflower uh, and all this stuff. It's been super super fun to follow up on the Cowboy community, Scott. Uh, Adland will be there next week, I believe on uh, Wednesday next week, answering your questions. So you can put your video in there. Um, what, what's your take, uh, I'm not trying to put you on the spot to speculate because we don't want to speculate because we don't know what the world's going to do, but what's your take on the, on the tours plan, uh, at least the PGA tours plan to, to come back June uh, 10th at, at Colonial. They're saying no fans uh, and sort of obviously testing is the key to this. As, as someone who's, who's been around the block on the tour a little bit and understands their politics probably pretty well, what, what's your thought on it? Yeah. It's, it's a really complicated issue, and I don't think it matters what you say you're going to irritate somebody with your answer, right? Um, I, yeah, I think sure. it's really important that we balance that we balance um, going back to work with making sure that we're not putting anybody in jeopardy, right? And I think that the tour is doing everything that it can to ensure exactly that. And uh, the first tournament is slated to be Schwab at, at uh, Colonial. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm going to go because I haven't played in a couple of years and I'm still eligible and yeah. I can't wait because um, it's just one of those things that I, I think that I think that as, as you say, testing is going to be important, but it's more important to find out who's been exposed already. It's I, I think it's perfectly reasonable to extrapolate that a lot more people have been than we assume. And I think you know, the scientists are deal, dealing in hard numbers. But the, but the fact is that there are a couple of studies out, you know, there's a the Stanford Santa Clara one and they yeah. took one down in LA and there's another one that says that maybe as many as 14% of the people. So th there are a lot of people who are carrying antibodies. I think the bigger question is, you know, do the antibodies protect you going yeah. down the road? And I, and I think we'll find out that a lot of us have been exposed to it already. And, and the next question is, you know, what's the safety factor going forward? But I think the tour is going to take every step that it can to ensure that people are as safe as possible. And that includes not just the golfers and the caddies, but the people putting on the tournament, the spectators, you know, the first few tournaments may not have spectators. You know, we're going to have to start this thing slowly, but, uh, you know, I'm in favor of getting back at it as fast as we can. Yeah. And you, you were an assistant, I believe, on the 2008 Ryder Cup team. So you, you've been in an environment where, where you know what the crowds matter. We had Thomas Bjorn and uh, Francesco Molinari on the other day. And like, look, they were joking that, uh, you know, that, that of course not having crowds there means they don't get booed, but they wanted crowds at the Ryder Cup. Do you think the Ryder Cup can be an event that is, um, you know, wor worth saving for the year if that means no crowds? Or would you be in favor of doing what they did after 9-11 and moving it back a year to, to kind of keep the event what we know it? Well, I think the Olympics have gotten ahead of this and they, and they've, they've backed it up to next year. I, yeah, you know, I think that we have to do, we have to really, I think you throw out um, conventional wisdom at this point. I don't, I don't think there's anything that anybody knows. And I don't think any reference point that we have is applicable. I think we have to do the best that we can to, re, to return to any kind of normalcy. Uh, you know, when, when things are, are really hard, the, the best way to combat that is to meet them head on, right? And so this is, this is a worldwide issue and we got to show resilience, we got to show toughness and we got we to show empathy and compassion. But, but you know, life is going to be just as bad if we don't return to some kind of normalcy or worse as it is if this thing, you know, t takes over. So I, I think in regards to certainly the Ryder Cup is going to be different than it's ever been before. Mm -hmm. The crowds are what yeah. make the Ryder Cup. And in without fail okay without fail the Ryder cup is 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 the sporting event that at least meets if not exceeds expectation every single time around and in large part because of what the fans do and players the way they elevate their games as a result so i just think that we have to keep an open mind and do everything that we can to get back at it and uh, and bring people the kind of joy and the enthusiasm and the the you know escapism that that we as uh, as athletes and entertainers always have for sure for sure and i think that uh you know the more the more you 
you get, you know, the, the thing that's so funny is we're talking about things in, in September and look, I mean, April's radically different than March was and March was certainly radically different than February. So kind of who knows. Yeah, and, to, and to that point today, April 23rd is way yeah. different than April 17th. I mean, things are exactly. evolving so quickly. We don't know what's going to happen. It, yeah. it may be, it may be end of days by then. And it may be, Hey, we look back yeah. and we go, man, we, we over, over judge this thing or whatever. We'll see. We'll just have yeah. to play it by ear. I think. Yeah. A couple more questions for you, Olin. Uh, this one from Mike uh, Galeski, and I'll be listening closely to this answer. What's your go-to wine with uh, with? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. I've got a nice bottle of O'Shaughnessy in there right oh. now, uh, which happens to be a household favorite. We're big fans of the Flora Springs group up there in, in St. Uh -huh. Helena. I, I love Flora yeah. Springs wines. Trilogy is kind of their flagship wine, but their single vineyard yeah. cabs are off the charts. The truth is, is that, you know, you, you pour a bottle of wine or pour a glass of wine and, and one glass may be better than another, but it's hard to find a bad one. So tell, yeah. tell Mikey, and, tell Mikey, and I, I guess he's listening right now. I don't have any Costa Brown. So no. you know my address and come on down here and visit and bring some with you. Seriously. I've been trying to go on that waiting list for like five years. The other ones that. So uh, is everybody so, else. <laughs> yeah. O o O'Shaughnessy. Uh, we, we did a trip up there. Uh, and oh, did a great. tasting at that vineyard and it's like you get lost going in there there's that that hidden gate then the second gate and by the time you find it the wine was amazing uh and the other one we've been we've been drinking a little bit of mount brave uh oh, which is great. sort of uh chris i can't think of his last name the winemaker but it's mount brave cardinal and la coya la coya is uh you know oh, the one that you say the special good occasion. Wine. cardinal's delicious too Yep. Yeah, but this this Mount Brave has been really, really good. That's been a uh, a fun part of quarantine. Is trying you know, you know that, that whole we... that whole wine thing in Napa. You can do it like top hundred golf courses. Yeah, if you if you try and hit all the greatest wineries in Napa, and some of them are hard to get into, but boy, I'll tell you what, that's a it's one of those kind of bucket list deals. Yeah, that's why I always make sure that uh, our media team always goes to the Napa tournament to cover the tournament and do some stuff because there's always some good extracurricular activities we can get into. Wise, wise beyond your years, Grasshopper. Yeah, we try. We try. All right. <laughs> uh, Colin wants to know, can you still beat your son up? Oh, I can't beat him up. No. I can, <laughs> what I can about, get what in about his head off? I can get in his head a little bit, but man, if I, if I, if I make a move on him, he's going to body slam me like a shot. He's got bumps all over him. He works out like a demon, hits the ball forever. No. He's, he's out of my league. All right. Well, I mean, what, what do you remember? This is always a question we, we asked a lot of our players uh, when, when they were, you know, growing up, when was the first time you beat dad? When was the first time that he beat you on the golf course? Do you remember it? Yeah, he was probably, uh, gosh, he was probably 17 years old. And um, it, it, had, it had come down to the wire a couple of times. And I birdied the last hole a couple of times just to tie him, to, to stave him off. But mm -hmm. when he was 17 or so, he, he finally took me down. And boy, he was as happy as, as he could have been. But you know who was happier for him? I was. You know, yeah, every dad every dad wants his kid to soar, right? And uh, both of my kids, uh, so proud of them. I love them so much. And, and they, they, uh, I want nothing for them more than for them to achieve their lifetime dreams. Yeah, and it's always, it's always great because he, he earned that moment too. It wasn't something like, like, you know, it was, it was. Oh no, there's no, moment. there's no gifting. And by the way, you're yeah. doing on a disservice if you do that. Right. I mean, yeah, you got to totally. bust, you got to bust them up a little bit. You got to needle them a little bit. And, you know, I've got a couple of expressions that I use that really irritate him and mm -hmm. he lets me know it. And so naturally th they come out whenever you get the opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, but, th but that's part of it too. Right. I mean, the yeah. whole point is it's much better earned than it is given. Yeah. Champions tour question. I always love to ask people. Uh, I ask facts this one, whenever we're with him, who are a couple names out there on the champions tour who you feel are sort of underappreciated for how good a players that they were. Maybe they didn't have the results in terms of, of, of the wins or look, you know, when you run into when Greg Norman was at his best or people, you know, who ran into tiger at his best, who are some players out there that, that, that we have a chance to watch now that you're like, man, this guy was so good. And, and you're glad to see them kind of have success now. Yeah, I, I, I think there are a couple that come to mind. Obviously, Scott McCarron has had a great run here the last couple of years. I think he's won nine or ten events, yeah. and he's second only to Bernhard. And he's really been yeah. making a good run. Um, and, you know, the thing about the Champions Tour is that unlike the PGA Tour, where rookies come off the Corn Ferry or the, or the Corn Ferry Q, uh, Q School, mm -hmm. um, there are guys – matriculating to the champions tour that are hall of famers or future hall of famers, you know, Retief Goosen, for example, came out last year and promptly won senior players. And so, you know, there, there's so many, so many named guys, but if you're looking for under the radar guys, 
you know, Brett Quigley, like you said, he won early, yeah. early this year in, in the first event, uh, first start of the year. And his skill set translates really well. He hits the ball farther than average, and he's a brilliant chipper and putter. And you know what? Those are good things to have in your qu- quiver when you go out on the golf course. These golf courses that we play, we don't get to play Riviera anymore. We do play Pebble Beach, but, um, you know, we don't play the, the biggest, longest golf courses, although you, people will be surprised at, at how long exactly we do play them. So, you know, if a course is 7,200 yards for a major championship, we're right there on the back tee. So uh, anybody who hits the ball, you know, in the neighborhood of 280 to 290 and, and can chip and putt is a guy who has a skill set to do really, really well and for an extended period. And Quigley makes a lot of birdies too. So if you're going to go out there a ton and, of and, and when you start making birdie after birdie, then, you know, that kind of gets you rolling. All right. Uh, well, they feed on know, themselves. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Wayne wants to know uh, your thoughts on the Masters in November. Look, the whole the whole major calendar is thrown up in the air. But uh, what are your thoughts on a November Masters? Well, I think it's again, out, we got to think outside the box. Right. I think the fact that they're they're committed to having it this year, I think is terrific. I think it's a shame that the Open Championship got canceled. Um, yeah. Things are a little bit tougher over in, in Europe than they have been over here. And I don't know why that is. I think those are the kinds of things that people will analyze in retrospect and we'll be able to get a better handle on that. But, but uh, you know, Augusta will have had the benefit of an entire summer of growth. And then, they're of course, going to top uh, overseed everything. So uh, yeah. I've never played Augusta in November. I played it in December when it's cool and it's wet and it plays forever. Um, I don't know necessarily if that'll be the case in November, because if it, if it's just at the tail end of a long, warm summer, the course could be cooked and it could be playing fast and, you know, they know how to control things up there. So it'll be in optimal shape, but I think we're going to see, you know, an Augusta that we haven't been familiar with. Certainly there won't be any of the, of the dogwoods or the azaleas in bloom, the wisteria climbing the trees, but it's still Augusta national and it's still an incredible event. So kudos to them for putting it on in November, and I'm looking forward to watching it. See, I'm convinced that they've already, uh, or they're they're working to research how to make a fall bloom, and they're going to figure out how to do it because they if might well. Planet Canada be it, it would be that group, um, and then you know the 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 PGA, you know San Francisco in August could actually be spectacular uh, if if that one happens. You know uh, Harding Park. Have you been to Harding Park for any of the other events? Yeah, there? Play, played and, it many many times. Played the WGC okay. there in 2000. And, and uh, five, and then we played mm-hmm. uh, t- our tour championship there a couple of times. So Hardy Park is, and right around that time of year, now we were closer to November for our tour championship, but Hardy Park is a terrific layout. And August and September in uh, San Francisco are beautiful months. So look for crystal clear blue skies and uh, really nice conditions on the golf course. And I think guys will be very pleased to be there then. And you know what's not far from, uh, from Harding Park for those of us who have a chance to potentially be there. Napa. Exactly. We'll bring it full circle. <laughs> bring, bring, bring the tuna on the plane. We'll get some good wine. We'll find a place to, to, to sear it and uh, you know, we'll be in good shape. Sounds like a plan. All right. Well, Olin Brown, thank you so much for joining us here on the Callaway Golf Podcast. Next week, we have a great week in store for us. We have Sam Burns on Thursday. Young player. Have, have you seen Sam out there? I mean, long about hitting, a guy young player. Oh, boy. Yeah. He's got some skills. You know what he did? Uh, LSU, right? Yes. Uh, and uh, I know there was uh, then he he got into, I guess, a tournament in Tampa and played with Tiger in the final round and stood well, toe to toe with him. He, he's got it a, was, he's was, got a lot of at Honda. Yeah, it was at Honda. And, oh, and, Honda, yeah, is, okay. and I'm going to talk about it. If you look at the videos, either the second or first or second hole, he walks up to Tiger and he kind of puts his arm around him. And no one kind of knows what he said. But Tiger starts laughing. And apparently Sam said to him, he's like, man, look at all these people out here to see me. And Tiger just got a kick out of that. So that should be pretty funny. Uh, And then on Thursday, a show that we're probably going to need some censorship for, we have uh, Colt Nost and Kelly Kraft joining us. So um, I thought, I thought you're, I thought you're going to, yeah, you will need some censorship. (laughs) (laughs) You need the seven second delay. Yeah, that, that one could be a colorful uh, Callaway Golf podcast. So we hope you'll join us for all of those. Uh, I know that the, the fitting room guys have Patrick Dawson, one of our, uh, gurus in uh, engineering who are going to be on talking short game next week. And then uh, Lex and Sarah on Girls and Golf have Madeline Sagstrom, who won earlier in the year on the uh, LPGA event in Florida. So pretty anyway, awesome lineup. Pretty awesome lineup. Yeah, we're, we're trying. And uh, now it's time for me to go into my own war room and, uh, and, and get ready to watch this pick. So, Owen, we'll thank see what you happens, so much. Right? Yep. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, everybody, for listening and watching. And we'll see you next time on the Callaway Golf Podcast.